Good morning, everyone. It's a delight to see you here bright and early. Uh, my name is Teresa Fallon. I'm with the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies, and it's been a huge honor to attend. This is my first time at this conference and my first time in Estonia, and it's just been bliss. So I've really enjoyed meeting many of you and exchanging views. This morning's topic is China's game in Europe, what rules, what stakes. We have an excellent panel here. Uh, as We've been talking a lot about Russia, but uh, Madeleine Albright said recently in an interview that the biggest threat possibly is China, and everyone's focusing so much on Russia. Over the longer term, China is far more of a threat, is according to Madeleine Albright. So we can touch on that in the panel. We've seen a huge increase in Chinese investments all around the world, but actually quite dramatically in Europe. And this was welcomed, especially after the financial crisis, but we see a dramatic change now because it's very difficult for Europeans to invest in China. So this idea of reciprocity is becoming an issue. So as China's investments skyrocket in Europe, their European companies are finding it far more difficult to do business in China, and also a long list of complaints about how difficult it is to function with data, um, Chinese Communist Party cells have to be embedded in European companies, and this leads to a lot of questions about do they get promoted? How does this work over the long run? So to start, uh, we're going to start with Jürger Hellstrom, and I'm going to uh, give a plug for his excellent publication. It's called China's Acquisitions in Europe. I read this, and I'm so delighted to have met him for the first time here, but we've been corresponding by email. So I recommend it highly. Take it away. And Jürger is... Um, Head of the Asia and Middle East Program, Division of Defense Analysis, Swedish Defense Research Agency. Here you go. Thanks, Teresa. Um, well, it's actually my first time here as well. I'm delighted to be here. It's uh, an excellent, excellent organization. Uh, I've been very impressed by all the previous panels and happy that we get to the topic of China. And um, just to continue, I think we see it uh, on the screen, sir. Um, with this uh, cover, uh, I wanted to talk a bit uh, about the, the image on the cover, which is obviously of um, showing Xi Jinping visiting David Cameron in 2015, in late 2015. And David Cameron took uh, Xi to a, a pub um, outside, north uh, west of London, uh, just a five minute drive from the country house of the British prime ministers. Um, for a pint of uh, Indian pale ale and fish and chips. Um, and um, this uh, story could end there. I mean, it's a good story enough. Uh, but the fact was that one year later, uh, this pub was acquired by a Chinese investment company um, for two uh, million uh, pounds, I think it was. Um, and um, well, w when I did this report, uh, I was looking actually at the European perceptions of Chinese investment, uh, mainly acquisitions uh, in Europe. and. Um, uh, if you look at the concerns that are being raised from, from Europe, uh, you could, you know, you could uh, sort of put this as a case of uh, uh, investment in critical infrastructure. Or um, you could also be concerned over the fact that the Chinese investment company later decided to open more than 100 uh, identical the plow pubs in China. The, the first one was actually opened in March this year. Um, but, um, well, I, actually, I don't go into that case in the report. Um, but I want to uh, raise uh, a, a couple of, of cases, um, actually the ones, uh, some cases from Sweden um, that have happened during the last year. Uh, previously, we've been focused on one single investment being Volvo Cars back in uh, 2010. Uh, which was, of course, a huge investment made by a private Chinese company, Geely. Um, but now, uh, in, during 2017, there have been a number of cases that have uh, raised some um, concerns and interest uh, in Sweden. Uh, and I'd like to just briefly go through them. Um, in, in April, uh, there was the issue of the naval facility and shipyard in Gotland, uh, Foresund. Um, and uh, this uh, particular acquisition uh, raises the question, why? Uh, Ming Wai Lao, a Hong Kong businessman, buys this uh, facility for 7 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, and he says that he wants to uh, give it to uh, the armed forces, uh, who was the previous owner, actually, um, without a lease, so for free. 
Um, why? Uh, the armed forces, the navy says no, uh, and uh, slightly later, uh, he sells it to the armed forces for $2 billion, less than one third of the, what he paid for it. Uh, that's one case uh, that's been uh, very, uh, raised a lot of interest in, in Sweden. The second one, um, in the deep water port in Lysekil, uh, sort of, uh, well, on, on the Swedish west coast, um, where uh, two consultants, Swedish based consultants, uh, were working for two SOEs, state owned enterprises in China, um, and uh, would develop a deep water port here in, in Lysekil. Um, but suddenly they walked away due to negative press coverage, um, partly related to environmental concerns. Um, so they walked away, but we still haven't heard from the actual two SOEs. There's been no response. We don't know that these um, two consultants even worked for the SOEs. And the third case I want to bring up is the high-speed railway between Oslo and Stockholm where uh, a Chinese uh, national investment promotion agency visits Oslo uh, in January this year, um, showing interest in financing this 17 billion euro project. Um, uh, the head of delegation is being interviewed by Norwegian media. Everything's fine. Uh, it's been, been given a very good reception. Uh, then Swedish journalists dig into this and they uh, talk to the agency in the head office in Beijing and they say that this person who has been interviewed by Norwegian media does not exist. He does not work for this company or for this agency. Uh, we didn't send a delegation to Oslo. Uh, and what I think these three cases of why, what and who uh, sort of raise is that uh, a lot of things are happening. Uh, but we don't really know what. Um, there's a lot of intransparency, um, uh, and we, uh, if you look at the data, it's uh, all over the place, as it is with foreign direct investment data. It's hard to come by good numbers. Um, you can only really agree on the fact that very strong growth is happening in terms of Chinese investment in Europe. Um, Bloomberg had uh, numbers recently saying that uh, so far, Chinese companies had invested or, or acquired assets for up to 318 or at least 318 billion US dollars so far in, in Europe, whereas uh, the Chinese Minister of Commerce uh, puts the number at 70. So 70 compared to 318, so quite a bit, a bit of uh, difference. And of course, uh, if you look at the Chinese official numbers, three out of four destinations for Chinese FDI are tax havens. So of course, a lot of money is going through tax havens. Um, now, what do we know really about what China is doing, or what it wants? Uh, I mean, there's a, a lack of knowledge in, in general uh, on FDI. We do have the 13 five year plan. We have the uh, Made in China 2025 plan. Um, China is quite transparent with what it wants. Um, it wants to develop its artificial intelligence industry, robotics, aeronautics. And what's um, vital for this plan is partly semiconductors. This is happening also in Sweden, investment in semiconductors, deals that have not been made public. Um, but uh, thanks to the European Commission's um, a directive on uh, anti-money laundering directive, uh, it is now possible in Sweden to uh, search for actual owners of enterprises in Sweden. Uh, I did this search, turns out um, 847 companies in Sweden are owned by Chinese citizens. Uh, and a lot of those are in the semiconductor sector. Uh, even, uh, there are even examples where um, niche leaders have been acquired by uh, Chinese companies in the defense sector, which is interesting considering the arms embargo. Um, just to conclude, um, there is a lack of knowledge of um, how large the actual investments are, uh, of specific cases, what the interest, the underlying interests are, uh, what the funding looks like, um, and sort of um, what the logic is behind some of these acquisitions. Uh, and can stop there. Thank you. Excellent, Jürger. Uh, on Monday, the parliament had a vote on the foreign direct investment screening mechanism. Now, three years ago, <coughs> It would never even be talked about at the European level. And it seems that there's been a, a major turning point 
perhaps in response to all of this Chinese investment. It's not designed just for China, but it's for all foreign investment. Out of the 28 member states, if I understand correctly, only 14 have a screening mechanism. So do you think that, uh, what's your take on the possibility? Now, the Commission has had a statement. Um, Brussels, Par the European Parliament has added 450 amendments, so it's going to be much more strict. It will be trilogued now to see, work out the language, but the main differences between, uh, the Commission said we will uh, we may screen, whereas the Parliament said you shall screen, so which could create a huge bottleneck for foreign direct investment. And there's also the narrative in Europe that if we have such difficult uh, screening mechanisms, maybe the Chinese won't want to invest here anymore. Um, maybe you can comment on that. Well, uh, of course, screening mechanisms don't only uh, cover Chinese investment. Uh, and I think that's a really important point to make, uh, that Right now, China is uh, sort of um, the origin of most of investments happening today. Uh, so that's why we have this panel on China, obviously. Um, but I think uh, the language when it comes to may or shall, uh, I would be surprised if, uh, if there would be an agreement on the, the shall language. I think language is very important in this case. Uh, another thing. Um, of course, what I mentioned now with the possibility to go through the company registration offices to find out actual owners of companies, that's only investments that have already been completed. What's happening now, uh, what's happening tomorrow, is something that I, this would uh, deal with, and I think that's uh, quite important. Excellent, thank you. I'd like to pull in Maria now uh, to get the European uh, institutional response. Maria Martin Pratt is the director of the in the European Commission Directorate General for Trade, where she is responsible for services, investment, intellectual property, and public procurement. Thanks, Teresa. Um, I'm gonna um, invert uh, the order of what I wanted to say to follow up on an issue you just raised, which is the screening regulation, the proposal that was put on the table by the European Commission in September last year and it's been, is still under negotiation both in the Council and in the European Parliament. You are absolutely right. Uh, this is not a proposal that we would have thought or considered two or three years ago, but I will still want to put it in perspective. Uh, it is not a proposal to establish a European screening mechanism. It is a proposal to coordinate uh, the screening mechanisms that exist in member states and to allow for, as well, an exchange of information between member states as regards foreign direct investment from any third country. It is not uh, China-specific. And it's only on two very specific grounds, which is security and public order. And, and I'd like to, to make that point very clearly. We don't see the proposed regulation as a tool to manage trade or to open the Chinese market. Although in the political debate, this often comes as the purpose. But we need to be extremely careful, at least from the point of view of those of us uh, in the European Commission in charge of trade and investment. Um, it is very important not to distort the notion of national security. It's been distorted enough these days by other countries. Uh, and we would like to very, very much separate the fact that we need to have a better understanding as to what's happening in terms of third country investment, including in particular China, uh, from the fact that we do have other problems in terms of market access uh, to their country. This has to be dealt by different instruments. This is important uh, to understand. And we haven't proposed that uh, the Commission will screen and not even the European Parliament. The Parliament is trying to reinforce a little bit what we will do. Um, at the same time, the Council is trying to water down a little bit what we will do. We will need to see what happens in the, in the final negotiation. But I think that is that is important. And it's gonna be one of the big challenges we have going forward with trade policy. How to make the difference, if it is gonna be possible, that one thing is economic interest, another thing is national security. Now, going back then, uh, having left the, the, the screening uh, mechanism uh, negotiations aside, uh, what it is very clear is that when you look at the European Union and China, you are comparing 
one of the most open economies or group of economies in the world with one of the most restrictive uh, countries uh, in terms of openness for the economic uh, for the economy in the world uh, that gets reflected in the amount of foreign direct investment that uh, China holds in the European Union as compared to the amount of foreign direct investment uh, that the European Union companies held in China but it is also reflectly, reflected, generally speaking, in, in the access or not access we have to the Chinese market. I'm the <laughs> chief negotiator for the ongoing negotiations with China for an investment treaty. They have been ongoing now for um, four years, which is not unusual. Uh, trade and investment uh, negotiations are often a labor of many years, but it is when dealing with these issues that that you are confronted firsthand, first of all, with the formal barriers our companies have to enter the markets. Those are well known. We know that there are many sectors of the Chinese economy that are off uh, reach for uh, foreigners. We do know as well that there are restrictions like requirement of uh, joint ventures, <coughs> equity caps, uh, the treatment of foreign invested companies or entities, as, as they call them, is different from the Chinese ones, so there is even a problem of national treatment. But there's also an increasing problem, which I think actually is, is going to be the main one going forward, which is not the formal barriers to our investors, our companies, but the informal barriers. As China is proceeding to open on paper, certain sectors, we continue to see, and we actually see an increase in the manner in which informally uh, our companies face barriers, whether it is um, requirements of technology transfer in the course of accreditation of technology, in contracts for public procurement, specific conditions in joint ventures, these are the realities of, of our companies that make in a way that when we negotiate with China now, as important as it is to increase our access to the market, it is to improve the situation of our investors once they are in the market. Um, Do you think that uh, because of China's already uh, great <coughs> level of investments. Many analysts have suggested that this screening mechanism will just be practically toothless. But it's, it's good that it, they will share information, and that's a good start. But um, for example, the usual holdouts might make it difficult for this to get passed. Um, even if it's watered down, do you think, wh what's your outlook? Can you comment on the future of this? Because some feel that countries that have already received, received a great deal of investment from China will, will bar this, will, will block this. Because we've seen um, Greece in the past blocking certain yeah. uh, things. So how do you perceive this? Okay. Let me, again, sorry, I might sound repetitive, but this is very important. The screening mechanism is not a tool to gain access to China market. Right. For that, we have trade and investment negotiations. Now, going to the screening mechanism, you need to look at it from the point of view of member states. We are talking about a concept like national security understood as national security. I'm not understanding national security as the production of cars or lorry parts. I'm talking about national security as a sufficient threat to the stability of a country or society. Um, those are areas that traditionally are part of member states' remit, uh, although we do take them into account and we can intervene uh, to some extent. What we are trying is to tell member states, look, we have an internal market. As imperfect as it is, uh, your economies are interlinked, and even if it's not something that is familiar, your national security is also interlinked. If a Chinese company buys in a country, the company that provides the security equipment to the police of another country, and I'm giving a real example of two European countries, there is a concern 
as to what is happening, even if, I mean, it's, the example was of a UK company and, and, and the German police forces. Germany can have a legitimate concern as to an investment, which is a foreign investment, into the, into the UK. Uh, we have other examples. So what we're trying to convey to member states is national security is not only what happens to you because of the investments that happen within your borders, it's what may be happening in another member state because investment is happening over there. Now, we are realistic enough to have put on the table something that tries to coordinate without trying to replace member states in terms of the assessment of the national security threat. Is this toothless? I don't think it is. Uh, I think uh, if we manage to land at the end of the negotiations to a text that is close to what we put on the table is ambitious enough at this stage. Sorry, excellent. I'm going to pull Roland in because you mentioned that uh, we've seen two major reports published in Europe recently on China's influence activities, one from ECFR and one from... Um, Merix. Merix. Uh, and yeah, GPPI. Uh, together. So these were quite disturbing. I recommend you can find them both online. They're free. I, I recommend that you look at this. They've plotted out uh, China's influence that Roland's going to... Yeah. I'm curious to get your actually, views actually, on this. Thank you so much, <laughs> Teresa. Thanks for having me here. It's, it's not my first time in Estonia. <laughs> um, but it's great to be back. So I, I want to refer to a third document. I mean, the two that you named um, uh, were, were, were totally ingenious. But let me come back to this concept of sharp power. Uh, this was coined by... Uh, the National Endowment for Democracy in December last year um, in a big report on Russian and Chinese influence across the world in support of authoritarian regimes or authoritarian ideas um, in you know, Latin America, and then they split it up into several regions of the world. So sharp power, you know, we all know soft power, the allure of culture <clears throat> and values. We all know what hard power is. I mean, that's you know military uh, uh, or 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 economic, but sharp power is um, what what helps authoritarian regimes coerce and manipulate opinion abroad. Now that sounds really sinister, uh, sounds really <laughs> ominous, but uh, if we talk about Chinese foreign direct investment in the European Union. We do need to see this larger concept that it definitely is intended in some cases to project Chinese sharp power uh, in, in, in Europe or same thing in the United States and other parts of the world. Um, give you an example. Greece, Greece vetoed a, a European uh, Union, what was it, a statement on human rights in China a few days after a Chinese firm heavily invested in the port of Piraeus, actually saving it, basically, financially. Uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is just one concrete example where foreign direct investment, you know, exerts some kind of influence, uh, even if there is no official message sent by the Chinese government. Um, and that is the, that is, it, it, the main characteristic of sharp power is actually it wants to produce um, uh, kowtowing without, without even receiving orders. Uh, so, and, and, and that is why this national screening mechanisms and a coordination of those on the European level uh, should be so important. Um, because uh, I mean that's only and that's only one of the ways that uh, the European Union um, should react to Chinese sharp power. I think we also need to vastly improve our expertise on China, uh, and this must be independent expertise, financially not bankrolled by the Confucius Institute or other Chinese institutions. Um, uh, we we need to definitely uh, network among the institutions dealing with China in the European Union. Uh, and, and, and we definitely need to work with our allies, both in the United States on this, but also with China's neighbors. 
immediate neighbors in Asia. And these are just some of the points where we have to strategically react to it. But I think it is important to see, to see Chinese FDI as part of a larger strategy, even though Chinese experts and government representatives often go to, um, to great lengths to, uh, to claim that there is no grand strategy uh, that China follows. Uh, but I mean, if you look at the rhetoric of the new era by President Xi Jinping at the last party congress, uh, which means a qualitative uh, jump in China's relations with the rest of the world, I think there very much is a grand strategy. Well, that's the best strategy of all, saying that you don't have a strategy, making everyone believe that. So this idea of preemptive obedience, uh, many EU member states, in some areas, they have what we call preemptive obedience. But on an earlier panel on the first or second day, Someone asked a question and the panelists didn't respond, so I'm going to pitch it out to you. We saw President Juncker attend the um, unveiling ceremony of the giant Mark statue in Trier. And even the Germans didn't know if they should take this statue, but um, Central and Eastern European member states lobbied him not to attend, the US lobbied him not to attend, but he went anyway. And he was there, even from a protocol point of view, the European president was with the Chinese ambassador unveiling this giant statue of Marx. How do you interpret that? Well, yeah, that's part <laughs> of sharp power as well, if you want. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, seriously, it, it, there was, there was a, a justified anger among the uh, formerly communist member states of the European Union, or the Eastern flank, or the new, the new member states, if you want, because of the role Karl Marx played in their historical memory. And there was maybe a lack of sensitivity on the part of the president of the European Commission uh, in taking these feelings into account. Um, you know, the fact that China donated the statue uh, was maybe in this spat inside the European Union was maybe of, uh, of less, lesser significance. Um, but I think it shows a certain uh, self-confident uh, uh, approach to, to, well, what would be in the Chinese definition soft power in this case. I mean, there were certainly no strings attached to, do, to, to donating the statue. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but I think it's, a very, it's, it's just a very self-confident dealing with um, uh, history uh, uh, and ideology and, and uh, you know, just display of, look, this is what we stand for. And, uh, and you, should, you should remember the positive aspects of that as well. And probably a more salient point, uh, at the same time that this conference is going on, the Shangri-La Dialogue is taking place. And in 2016, the EU was unable to give a strong support for the arbitral tribunal decision, which was between uh, the Philippines and China, largely due to Chinese investments um, in certain countries. So it was three member states opposed it, and, and the European uh, statement didn't welcome nor uh, support, it merely acknowledged. So in diplomatic language, that's the weakest um, position. So we could see uh, this was seen as a, a big victory. And now we see uh, um, if the one thing that the European Union does stand for is rule of law. So it was kind of a sad day that they were unable to respond to this arbitral tribunal decision. Mm. I'm going to bring you in. Um, Alan's with the Atlantic Council in the US. Mm. Um, yep. Well, I, was, I've, um, I got into this kind of by accident. Um, largely because I was dealing with some merger cases, and the merger cases involve Chinese companies. And when you started digging, the more you found, the more alarming it became. And I actually ended up writing a book uh, last year called The Potemkin Dragon on, on, the, on the Chinese uh, markets as a result of this. And I think the thing where I'd start is this, is what I think is very difficult for both the EU and the US is to recognize that we have been substantially and for over a long period of time naive about China. It is not going to become a liberal democracy or anything like it anytime soon. It is not going to comply with the rule of law in its own country and follow our systems anytime soon. It is not an open market. It is not going to be an open market. In fact, one can make a very strong case that in the 1990s, the Chinese markets were more open to Western capital and to Western business. And actually, since 2001, when they joined the WTO, they've become more closed. And Chinese, China has comprehensively uh, reneged on all its obligations under the WTO 
ever since 2001, and particularly since 2006. Uh, and the, the difficulty with all of this is that that's only the beginning of Western naivety. The next stage of Western na naivety is to say it really isn't an open market. It has all of the structures. It looks like one. They've got a stock exchange in Shanghai. They've got uh, all of these agencies, but none of them actually act like agencies in a liberal capitalist market democracy. I mean, one of the things I can t talk about a lot of it, but I think the one thing I'd simply focus on is the banks. If you take all of the banks in China, they are all controlled one way or another by the Chinese state. And if you want capital, whether you're a state-owned enterprise or you're notionally a private business, you have to do what the state wants. And in any business of any size or significance, you have a, the Chinese Communist Party boards and uh, Communist Party committees in those businesses. That is the reality. And let me then take you through to what that means for foreign investment. Let me just give you one example of this. We had a couple of years ago the ChemChina Syngenta deal. And you had ChemChina, which is a low-value Chinese uh, conglomerate of a lot of kind of itsy-bitsy <laughs> Chinese companies who do chemicals, not very high-tech, actually not very clever, not very actually profitable, loads of red ink over their balance sheets. Yet because it was a Chinese company and it was directed by the Chinese state, it could raise $40 billion worth of capital from a Chinese bank and buy Syngenta, which was a high-tech Western life sciences company. Now, in, in, no, in no commercial deal, in anywhere else, in any part of the, uh, of the Western ecosystem, could a low value, not very clever, not very profitable, in fact, red ink company, borrow $40 billion from anybody to go and buy, buy, some, uh, buy Syngenta. In fact, it should have been the other way around. Syngenta should be buying Chinese companies, but they wouldn't have bought ChemChina because it's such a terrible, terrible business. But that's what happened. And my, one of my, ChemChina Chem China buys Syngenta. And then, of course, you've got to say, well, what's going to happen? I mean, one of the real dangers with this is to then follow it through. And if you follow it through, it gets very alarming. Because the reason why they went for Syngenta and not for one of the American life sciences companies was because we don't have any CFIUS rules and it's easier to do so. But it threatens both Europe and America. Because once you've bought Syngenta, what you can do is you can put up, use all your barriers in the, in, in the uh, uh, trade barriers in China to close off the market to other life sciences companies, pump it through full of, of cheap Chinese cash to grow it even more, and sure, it has all the monopoly profits from, from the Chinese market and turn it into this global monster company which can then dominate the planet. Now, the problem is, is that if you really repeat that sector by sector, this is a huge threat to all of us. And we're just being very naive and saying, oh, we can't do stuff, whatever. Well, we have to start realizing that's a real part of the problem. And we have to start looking at how we deal with this. Now, one of my arguments about it is, OK, what do we do? How do you actually sort of focus on this? And I think part of the trouble is with, the, with, with, with this is that the, the national security issue doesn't capture, either for the EU or the US, the scale of the problem. And one of the things I would suggest here is that one of the ways to deal with this is not, either re, it's not actually reciprocity, but it's the issue of the fact, it, is it a commercial deal? And this is one of the areas where I think the EU could actually have a significant role uh, at a European level, because the national security issues are obviously kind of difficult because member states have different roles. But the Commission could be, should be able to undertake a process whereby it says, is this deal a commercial deal? Is this an ordinary arm's length transaction which will be carried out in any Western market economy? And if it is, you can give it a pass. But if it's not, you block it. And that's something which technically the Commission can do. It doesn't involve national security. But it would, it would actually create, a, it would be neutral in terms of countries, but it would have direct and serious impact on, uh, on uh, the ability of Chinese companies to come in and do the sort of deal they did in ChemChina, Chem China, Syngenta. So I take it you weren't part of the audience at Davos that stood up after Xi Jinping's speech saying he was going to be the protector of globalization. No, he is he's the protector of Chinese <laughs> national interests and the extension of Chinese global influence. That's what he is. We saw with the KUKA sale of 
Germany has 12 robotic companies and KUKA is the number one. It had an incredible ad on television, on, on YouTube, you can see it, of a robotics arm playing ping pong with the world's leading ping pong player. And so the Chinese were like, that's the one we've got to get. But Medea, which was a white goods company, which sold refrigerators, washing machines, bought this very high-tech robotics company. And analysts discovered that within two months of the sale, German engineers are designing things for the People's Liberation Army of China. So this causes maybe some problems in transatlantic relations. Um, if you have German engineers designing things for the Pacific uh, theater, or Indo-Pacific theater, I should say, this could you know, actually cause mm. some issues. So we saw Germany, France, and Italy kind of lead on this um, mm. idea of having a screening mechanism. I think you've really hit the nail on the head, though, with this idea that the Commission has, or the European institutions have this power to uh, regulate. Mm. And, but we also saw with the Geely deal, um, kind of it was done very secretly, mm. and uh, Chinese investors in, uh, went after Daimler-Benz. And when it was finally learned that uh, Chinese interests were investing, it wasn't very transparent. So this issue of transparency, how can that, how can we do? Well, I think that what you do is, is, is rather like with the EU merger regulation. You have a rule which basically makes any deal uh, which falls within the, the scope of your, your, your regulation unlawful. Uh, so it, it, it's not legally valid until it's been cleared by the commission. And that's what you do, uh, and you know there is there, they have, you know the commission is quite happy to impose enormous fines if anyone makes it, and of course they, you can unscramble the deal. So that's what I think. That, that's where you go. And of course the other thing you can do with a foreign investment review is that any of the companies and any of the connected banks who have been engaged in it, you can simply block for ten years from uh, from acquiring anything within the European Union. That would that would that would concentrate their minds. And I think that was really a good point that you brought up the word naive because just looking at the. Um, articles written in Brussels or in the international press about this FDI proposed screening mechanism, that word constantly pro um, crops up. So everyone just felt that they were kind of taken advantage of, that yeah. they have open markets and then they were being kind of and abused. I, I also, I know Maria says about the WTO reciprocity issues, but frankly, if we have a situation where we have a serial and sustained breach of the agreements that were entered into by China since 2001, uh, where they've actually, as I say, they join the WTO, they get access to the rest of the world, they massively grow their economy, and then they act as trade pirates by basically closing themselves to us and continuing to close them to us. Then I think we have to say, well, if you're really not going to comply with this, we should be able to take substantial retaliatory measures, uh, and we should actually operate on a reciprocity basis. Uh, and if you want to argue with us in the WTO, it's okay. We'll put in what uh, 17 years of non-compliance with the WTO rules ever since. I mean, the uh, AmCham in uh, in uh, in Beijing has, I think, 49 different types of trade restriction, which they which which they say the Chinese deploy when they feel like it against Western companies. Now, you know, we should just basically say, okay. If you're not prepared to comply by WTO rules, mm. then both the US and the EU should be prepared to go on a reciprocity basis. Because what are we going to do here? Are we basically saying, and then there's, other, there's an underlying issue about populism and all of this, is that if we are not seen to stand up and defend our markets against illegal trade piracy, which is what this amounts to, when, and gross abuse of the agree international agreements the Chinese have entered into with us, then how can we expect our, pop, our, our populations to think that they are defending our interests? And how can we be legitimate with our own people? Very good. Maria, I wanted to follow up with the WTO because Cecilia Malmström just uh, announced that uh, they're taking uh, a case against China as well to the WTO on enforced te technology transfer. Do you want to comment on that? Hmm. Yeah, I can, can comment. You comment on that? I can comment on it uh, a little bit. But let me just nuance uh, your statement, yeah. uh, because it's not that easy. I don't think it is correct to say that China has systematically infringed its WTO commitments since it exited to WTO. If it was the case, it would be much easier. Uh, what we actually see, and we need to remember, is that a number of the commitments that China took when joining the WTO, for instance, in the GATS context, which is the one that affects the most 
investment because GATS mod three establishment equals uh, to uh, investment. Uh, their commitments in certain sectors are very limited. So are commitments of other countries as well. So in, in a way, it is not such a blatant problem. We do have problems, uh, but if it had been that obvious, uh, you would have seen a much larger number of cases taken against China in WTO that you have seen. And by the way, when cases have been taken against China in WTO and China has been uh, condemned, uh, they have complied with, with the rulings of the appellate body. Um, and, and again, I, I get back to the point I was trying to make in, in, in my intervention. A number of the problems we have with China are problems because we don't have the rules to address them. And there I can take the point as to changes in competition law in a state aid. We have to think as well as to the need to complete uh, the rule book of the WTO. Those, those are changes that may be needed, but, but it's not uh, it is not that obvious as to say they are just blatantly ignoring WTO obligations. I don't think that's the case. As regards the, uh, the case that we have launched now, the request for consultation with China, does relate to a specific legislation uh, in China that affects indeed uh, the licensing of technology of <coughs> foreign companies when they bring it into China. Uh, it is both as regards to invention requirements in legislation and specific requirements in a Chinese law that is uh, related to transfer of technology by foreigners. Tier is, is the case. The US did launch a very similar case a uh, couple of months ago. Do you think that there's some scope for the US and Europe to cooperate in this type of That's field? I know these days the relations are a bit strained, but do you? Can you envision that? There should be. There should be a way for the US, for the EU, for Japan, which is a country which is equally concerned, and others to cooperate. Um, repeated recent actions of the US do not facilitate uh, cooperation, not even with your closest allies. Uh, I still think that uh, there is a need to ensure that there is cooperation if you want to address some of the problems created by China, definitely. And in the WTO, very, very clearly. There is something else that Europe needs to consider, and this is something in the hands of Europe. Our markets are incredibly open. Uh, if you look into the principles in the treaty that underpin the European internal market, of the four freedoms, free movement of goods, services, persons, and capital, the free movement of capital, it is the largest. It is not only allowing free movement of capital between member states, but also between member states and third countries. Uh, if you look at our public procurement markets, they are completely open. Um, now, some of the changes that people think sometimes can be done will require treaty change. Treaty change is a very difficult undertaking. Some of the changes, like public procurement, don't require treaty change, and there is legislation that can be considered to do that. I'm going to open up the floor in just a couple of minutes, so prepare just, your questions, but please back. jump in. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I understand some of the things, stuff about, about the appellate board cases, but the problem with this is that it's a very formalistic reading of the of market access, I mean, uh, one, you know, one hundred has to talk to some of, uh, sort of major tra major trading companies from different member states, and the reaction you get is the markets are closed and are are closing. They're much less open than they were some years ago. What you also get is the um, companies kind of giving up. It's just ch China is too difficult because of the these the endless levels of different forms of restrictions, and you get the fact that if you try and function in China, what you actually get is the, the level of discrimination, uh, the regulatory discrimination. I mean, one of the areas I know best is the competition law re regime in China. Uh, you know, allegations of cartels, who are they made against? <coughs> They're made against Western companies. Merger and acquisitions. Hmm. Where, which companies get remedies, hit, hit, hit by remedies in merger cases? Hmm, it will be Western companies. Which companies 
get blocked by, uh, by the Chinese merger authorities, it would be Western companies. Abuse of dominance cases, it would again be Western companies. Dawn raids, it would be Western companies. You'll find very few Chinese companies affected by the antitrust rules. And what is more, when the Chinese obtain remedies in merger cases, the remedies is to provide, have got no link with the actual merger case. And it's all about trying to leave us some advantage for some Chinese company. And I think the, the, the difficulty you've got is, uh, I think, I, think the, I, I would agree the Commission has a, a difficulty here with this, is that the difficulty you've got is you've got this immense range of complex restrictions right across the market, which I don't think were really um, envisaged any country actually doing under, un, under the double toe regime, but that's what the Chinese are doing. And it's still a, a, a breach of, uh, of the uh, WTO obligations in spirit. And it has the same effect as the, uh, uh, as the, uh, as the under underlying obligation to operate on an open trading basis, which is essentially what they do not do. I know Roland wanted to comment yeah, on this. Just, just an observation here, because there, there is, there is a, a, an almost exact parallel in civil society to um, the development that Alan was describing for the economies. Uh, this asymmetry of, you know, Chinese <laughs> civil society if, 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 it, if it exists at all, being unable to cooperate with actors outside. Uh, whereas you have, like, uh, described the Confucius Institutes, I mean, there, and, and there's myriads of Chinese think tanks and universities going into uh, it, uh, Western countries and starting formal cooperation with the usual strings attached. Um, so, you know, I'll give you one example of what's happening in China itself now. Uh, the German party-affiliated foundations like Konrad Adenauer, Friedrich Ebert, and so on, uh, they, they can only cooperate with one single NGO. And it's called the Friendship Society, and it's part of the Chinese Foreign Ministry. And then any, they will select any partner in uh, China itself that they can have any formal cooperation with, uh, which leads to these foundations um, actually debating whether they should wrap up their operations in China. Of course, they're not doing this for the moment because the connection is so important. But, you know, the, it, it, any kind of normal uh, uh, cooperation with Chinese civil society is made impossible by this. Uh, and this is happening while we're seeing a multiplication of Chinese operations in our civil society. Um, now, can the answer to that be that we crack down, that we close down as well? Of course not. But certain awareness campaigns, you know, promoting independent China expertise and so on, that should be our answer. And, um, well, whenever there is Chinese intelligence uh, work involved in, like, for example, among expats, uh, Chinese student communities in the West, then, of course, we, we, need, we need to follow up on this with, with our own counterintelligence means. I want to pull you in on this um Australia is becoming kind of a laboratory uh, of Chinese influence. We've seen it in New Zealand, and the, these stories are increasing by the day. Um, there's been lawsuits now. There's kind of lawfare taking place for people who've written these reports. We saw the book by Clive Hamilton. Um, the, the, the publisher dropped it. He was afraid. Uh, the publisher did, refused because they were afraid to be sued by China. So there seems to be... Um, some similarities and some great differences, but do you see uh, growing uh, movements within Europe about this type of these United Front influence operations? I mean, Mao called them the three magic weapons and um, or magical weapons. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe you can comment on that. Well, I, I don't follow the issue uh, in particular, but of course, I, I, I re read about it with with big um, a lot of interest, of course. Uh, and I mean, we're now touching upon subjects, a very wide range of subjects coming, going from uh, actual legislation when it comes to trade and investment to sharp power and everything that's in between. And it's, I guess it's, we have to realize that it's all interrelated. Um, but uh, I think it's also important to, to raise the issue that it's not only about uh, when we talk about sharp power, for example, um, we can't say for sure that it's always Chinese intention behind it. Uh, sharp power, uh, per se, works 
uh, also in ways that are not intended. Um, say uh, country X um, wants to uh, attract investment from China, for example, and is acting in, in a way that it expects to, to uh, be able to receive those investments, for example, and so on. And uh, as, as you mentioned, Teresa, the, the case of the South China Sea, for example, um, uh, the Hague Tribunal, we don't know that that was due to Chinese pressure. Uh, could as well have been that these companies are, uh, these countries are um, deciding on, on a policy versus China in this case, just to, to be able to sort of to um, um, keep good relations with China, so to speak. Um, but in terms of um, United Front work in, in Europe, I think it's important to uh, keep track of what's happening. And I think there's, there's uh, now a lot of interest and in, in reporting about it, uh, the Taiwan issue. And I, we haven't um, touched upon specific issues uh, here, but I think uh, it's, it's important to uh, keep track of what's happening now that it's not only uh, the political landscape that has been targeted, but it's also the business community. Um, previously, uh, the issues of Chinese interference have been quite limited to um, meetings with uh, representatives of Taiwan, uh, representatives of the Tibetan uh, government in exile and so on. Uh, now it's also the business community. Um, so there's, an, of course, an, an intensified campaign of isolation against Taiwan. Uh, and to what extent this connects with what we're talking about here, uh, acquisitions um, and, 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 you know, whether it's actually connected um, f from Beijing. Uh, I think it's important to discuss this, but we have to keep in mind that uh, at times it's pure speculation. And I mean, China's a huge market. Let's face it, everybody wants to get into the China market. Right. The, the perception is that that's a place that they can make money. But we've seen with the announcement, I mean, China's very open about this. I mean, the China, made in China 2025, becomes almost, um, China wants to move up the value added chain like any economy, and they're, they're very focused on this. They've, they've laid out their strategy. But Europe, I think, was caught off guard a bit because I think that they thought they had a lot more time to uh, protect their, their innovations, but China's actually becoming more of a competitor. Mm -hmm. so, Maybe you can comment on that? Yeah, I mean, um, the fact that uh, Made in China 2025 was launched uh, in 2015 and the uh, plan to become a world leader in artificial intelligence by 2030, which launched just last year. Um, I mean, it's in a very short time frame that China is uh, aiming to become a world leader in, and a dominant um, actor in a lot of fields. Um, and uh, this, of course, also entails uh, acquisitions because it's, of course, impossible to reach those goals just by uh, growing organically. And in Europe, the investments we've seen are mostly uh, mergers and acquisitions, it's not Greenfield, so they're, they're going around exactly. buying what they can. And it was interesting because um, the head of German intelligence uh, noted that in two years that there was a real decline in cyber um, theft, and he, he, he stated publicly that it was because China just bought the companies, didn't need to spy on them anymore, and he called it um, the boiling frog syndrome. So that, I don't know if you've heard this uh, story before, but a frog, you can put it in a pan of water and it will stay in there. It could jump out, but it doesn't realize that it's, he's starting to boil. So that's how he characterized what's happening in German today, Germany today. So I'm, uh, how about some questions from the floor for the panel? Okay, and please identify yourself. Anke Schmidt-Felsmann, uh, Foreign Policy Research Institute. I have uh, a question to Alan Riley, uh, where I wonder what do you make of EU member states competing with each other, companies competing with each other for exclusive access, a little bit of what Erke Hellström already explained. How, how can you still square the circle and get a united action, maybe also to the others? And uh, the second issue to all, when do you know that investments are problematic? I mean, it, 
Director Martin Pratt, you explained to some extent the national security issues, uh, but is it that simple? And what if the member states or the companies are not wanting to take action simply because they're competing with each other? So how, is there really that much of a possibility of joint action? That's Thank a you. great question. I'm going to try to group some together. Oh, yes, please. Thank you very much. I'm Yoshizaki from National Institute for Defense Studies, uh, the Japanese MOD. And uh, it's a very fantastic panel. Uh, let me ask uh, the um, question regarding the big questions, the what rules and what stakes. And the question is quite simple. Is China is a game changer in a rule-based international order from your perspective? And uh, we have a lot of dialogue with China's counterpart. And their take is that they try to enhance and complete comprehend what is lacking. So, so that means that AIIB or Britain Road is to not to challenge, not to replace the existing order, but to try to fill the gap in order to have better investment or infrastructures. But when it comes to the global business or global challenges like uh, ODA, conditionality, Chinese record so far is not that very brilliant. One, when it comes to the support for the totalitarian regime, regardless of the conditional, uh, the human rights conditions. And uh, so in that sense, uh, we may be uh, skeptical about the sincerity of the, the Chinese uh, the idea. So what is your take? The Chinese big investment, the big ODAs, may be replacing your uh, rule-based uh, order. Or do you, do you see that it's just OK, it is a business, and you may be happy with the direct investment with China? Thank you. Okay, and this will be the third one. Thanks. Thank you. Chris Harper, an independent consultant. Uh, I also think it's been a fantastic um, panel. It's frequently said that in Europe at the moment, and indeed in the Western world, we lack long-term strategic vision and the means to develop strategy and then apply it. Whereas we look at China and see that there most certainly is one. And indeed, the current president seems to be able to provide some long-term consistency in delivering it. But could I ask the panel to give their analysis of what China's strategic goals are in a 50 and 100 year time span? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're sticking to the idea of 100 years of history. Okay. Um, so those are big questions. Uh, why don't we, so uh, game changer, uh, what rules, what stakes, long-term strategy and uh, long-term strategic vision here. Uh, please, why don't we, we worked on the panel start. Right? OK. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the two last questions uh, more or less went in the same direction. What, what is the long-term uh, perspective? And, and, and what's going to happen to the rule-based international order? Well, if I only knew. Um, <laughs> it, it, I think a, a very good um, way to describe uh, China's emerging perception of itself and its role in the world, it, for that, you can go back into history, into the past in this case. Um, in the first meeting between King George III, and uh, Emperor Qianlong in 1793. I think the, uh, the Brit, yeah, true to form, uh, was, was trying to advocate trade relations. And the answer he got was, um, we, have, we possess all things. We, have no, we set no value upon your products, be <laughs> they strange or ingenious. And something to this effect, you know, very strange, very strange language. But, but the, 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 the gist of it was, um, look, we, we, we don't need any of this stuff you're putting on the table here. And, and, and the same, I think, in the long run is true for China's attitude to values, rules, uh, whatever the rest of the world has produced or is trying to produce in terms of uh, global liberal order. Uh, ultimately, the goal would be to achieve um, a state of things in which China can decide these things on its own. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, the, 
it is called the middle, the middle kingdom, right? The, the, char the character for, for Zhongguo, the, the word for China in Chinese, uh, is the middle. And, um, you know, there is nothing evil about this. There is nothing uh, uh, absolutely sinister. But it's something that we have to take into account when we, when we look at uh, China's, China's strategy for the next uh, 50, 100, or 200 years, for <laughs> that Tian matter. Sha, all under heaven. How about you, Maria? Um, OK, let me start by the point that was made about um, member states competing with each other to attract foreign direct investment. That's normal. Member states compete for foreign direct investment, but that is not that relevant when we are talking about foreign direct investment that may constitute a threat to national security. It's not the same. It's not the same to have, say, the Czech Republic and Spain fighting over an investment to open yet another car manufacturing plant uh, than China deciding that wants to buy particular infrastructure whether it's a port, or whether it's an electricity grid, or particular technology. I mean, in, in those cases, it's not that you're going to have a fight between Germany and Belgium saying, don't buy KUKA, come and buy this company. So in that, in that respect, the, this discussion about uh, member states fight for investment, which is true, uh, and therefore there is a problem with the screening of investment for national security and public order, I don't buy it. Uh, I, I get that a lot, I get that a lot in the council discussions in the parliament, but I don't think that's, uh, that's a concern. China is a game changer, there is absolutely no doubt about it. I mean, the problem we have, in my view, is not so much whether they abide by the rules is that we do not have the rules to address a number of things they are doing. Um, and it will require an update of multilateral rules, which is made increasingly difficult by the attitude of some of our main trading partners that should have an interest in it. Uh, it, it may require a change of our own rules uh, in terms of the European Union. And I hear very often as well, they do have a long-term strategy. We don't look, I mean, well, first of all, it's easier to have a long-term strategy if you're one country than if you're 28. Even easier if you don't have a functioning <coughs> democracy as opposed to 28 functioning or not functioning democracies, but in any event, democracies there that make it more difficult uh, at some point to get a unified uh, view. But, but Europe needs to wake up. We do need to have a much more coherent uh, a strategy vis-a-vis um, -vis China. That is absolutely, we, we cannot continue to see it in silos, the silos of trade and investment, the silos of research, uh, the silos of cooperation on protection of, uh, I don't know, geographical indications. China plays these things uh, against us. Um, and that's something that does require an effort that is, that is much needed in terms of a new uh, strategy, a European strategy vis-a-vis -vis China. Excellent. Do you want to come in on this? Yes. Sure. Um, no, I, I thought uh, I'd start with the issue of um, the um, century-long strategy of China, the, the long-term vision. Um, and I think uh, it was raised by a previous panel, um, uh, this um, uh, quote by Zhou Enlai, uh, when uh, Nixon visited Zhou Enlai back in 1972 uh, in Beijing, and uh, Nixon asked him, so what is your analysis of the French Revolution? And he says, it's too early to tell, right? But that's a misquote. Uh, which is a misquote, <laughs> because uh, what he actually, um, what the, act uh, at least the interpreter was telling Zhou Enlai was, uh, so what is your analysis of the student protests mm. in, in Paris? So uh, four years earlier, and he always said it was too early to tell. But it's, th this uh, sort of, this myth uh, lives on uh, <laughs> because it uh, sort of tells the story of Chinese uh, long-term vision and um, uh, a special sense of humor as well, I guess. Um, but of course, um, when you're, uh, a, a one-party state um, where the 
president, uh, the secretary general of, of the, the Communist Party, does not have to um, deal with uh, any term limits and so on. I mean, of course, you can plan for, for the long term. You can have uh, longer than five-year plans. Um, but uh, I think what China's long-term strategic vision is uh, goes right now to, to 2049, the um, uh, 100-year anniversary of um, the People's Republic. Um, and it's quite clear what it's about. Um, Chinese uh, officials tend to emphasize that China is the only uh, bigger country that still has not been unified, although Taiwan was never part of the uh, People's Republic, of course. Um, and uh, that's you know, one, one of the goals, a unified country um, where China is a, a leader in uh, most, if not all, sectors just to put it uh, shortly. Yeah, yeah I, I, what I was going to, uh, this issue about, um, which was raised uh, amongst the questions, was this, uh, how can you get all the European countries together to do, to actually do anything? And I think there are, there are real, really deep issues here about the coherence of the union. And one of the questions that, that, that this has made me reflect upon is that if the don't know, this is kind of heresy I suppose given the current situation but um, I will be heretical um, do we actually need much bigger European Union budgets because do you if the, does the Union need more resources if you're going to be able to say to states that you can't do these deals with the Chinese. Do we need, um, is, there, or is President Macron's argument uh, 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 about um, a more liberal Eurozone order part of the solution to this? And then there's the other element of this, is that we must not shoot ourselves in the foot, and unknowingly shoot ourselves in the foot. I'll give you an example of this. On March the 6th, the European Court of Justice handed down this ruling uh, in the Slovakia Akmia case, where the European Court of Justice rather surprisingly struck out all e intra EU bilateral investment treaties. Now this sounds, what's this got to do with China? Well, the point about it is this is that uh, for a lot of uh, particularly Central Eastern European states, the bilateral investment treaties are a guarantee of the flow of capital, largely Western capital, into the Central and Eastern European states. If the European Court of Justice, for various reasons, strikes down all the bilateral investment treaties, what you're doing is reducing the amount of capital into the Central Eastern European states. Mm. And as a consequence, you're making them more dependent on Chinese capital. Now, this is not a good idea. And also, you could argue it divides the single market and so forth, because you know, it's much more difficult to integrate the single market as a result. But the, the Chinese line of this is, you know, this is not helpful for ensuring our investment security. And that is what we've done. But I think there's, there's one element of not shooting ourselves in the foot, and the other is thinking about it in terms of to what extent does the EU need to be able to offer more to states who otherwise would take Chinese investment. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and there's also another argument with our American friends, is to say the extent to which uh, the US can help here as well. And I think there is, there are, and there are, I think there's an EU-US dialogue, I know we have Mr. Trump, but there's an EU-US dialogue here, but there's also what we can do ourselves in Europe. And I think there is a, a real question of what we can do to keep the union together, and we have to change in order to deal with this threat. And the thing to understand, again, with all European states, is that, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of countries in Central and Eastern Europe see China as this great, place where you can get all this investment from, you have to understand the investment comes with very serious strings attached, which th ultimately can threaten your security and that of the union as a whole, and that has to be understood. Uh, you bring up an interesting point, because there's a, a, an upside to this, and Britain will pro probably miss this. Um, for example, we saw with that arms embargo, 
any member state that was lobbied by China to lift it, they would say, I'd love to do it, but Brussels won't let me. Mm. This could happen with the FDI screening mechanism. They can say, I would love to sell you X company or port or electrical grid, but you know, Brussels won't let me. These terrible Brussels people, <laughs> so, it's just dreadful. Yeah. So this kind of gives them plausible yeah. deniability. Yeah. And I was in a, a, a country that's, I won't say the country, I was at a conference, I was like, why are they so interested in this FDI screening mechanism? They're, um, they're not a, a member state, but they are part of the acquis. Yeah. And they're like, when are you going to pass that? Because they couldn't wait to use that as an excuse for not having to sell things to China. Yeah. So, um, and I'm so glad, Jerker, that you brought up that misquote, because I hear it so many times and I get so tired of it. But that, that was very good. And we've had this whole discussion about Chinese investment. We haven't mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, that's another, tying in the very first uh, panel about history and the uses of history, well, it's kind of this uh, reinvention of history in some quarters because it's the new Silk Road compared to the ancient Silk Road. So, Can um, I just say something about sure, the Silk please. Road? <laughs> I mean, the point about the Silk Road is that the essential reason why, they're in, in it, perhaps it's because I come from an island nation and I kind of <laughs> get this, the reason why the Silk Road sort of stopped working was partly the, kind of the wars and revolutions and the different barriers across the thing, but the big reason was that ships got better. And essentially, the sailing ships got better, they got they take much huge, larger capacities, whatever, and so you could move stuff much more easily by sea than over land. The thing is, you know, it hasn't changed. It's still easier to move stuff by sea than by land. Now, you know, if you look at the cost of moving vast amounts of stuff in huge container ships, it's still going to be cheaper to do that today from anywhere in China to uh, anywhere in the West and send it over land, you know, and, that, and that's, that's, that, that doesn't change. It was, uh, the Silk Road existed epistemologically in history at a point where ships weren't very good. But ships have become a lot better, and they've been a lot better since about mm, 1650. Well, 90% of world trade is yeah. done by, yeah. by, by sea, and right. no one expects it to, you know, yeah. it's very cheap and uh, yeah. it's very difficult. There are other strategic uh, aspects yeah. going on with yeah. the rail. But I'm ready to take, okay, please, and don't forget to identify yourself, thanks. Uh, thanks, James Oates, Cicero Capital. Um, the reason why the railway is speed. Um, yes, you, for bulk goods, of course, it's going to be ships, but that's not my question. Um, my question okay. is, the implications of the misallocation of capital that Alan talks about lead us to contemplate that old chestnut, the middle income trap. Do you think China's going to get trapped? That's a good question. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Uh, Jukka Mallin, Finland. Uh, it was interesting that uh, you put on the table this question with Taiwan. Uh, then you can ask who has annexed uh, most countries from China. Of course, it is Russia. You may know that uh, less than 200 years ago, uh, uh, a, Rus a Russian imperium annexed south of Siberia, Baikal, Vladivostok, Habarovsk, and, and, so, so, and so, so on. Uh, uh, as I remember, Mongolia was part of China until 1924. Uh, it, it is about 600,000 uh, square kilometers Rus Russia uh, annexed from China. So, and uh, as I know, today, uh, when the Chinese tourists come to Baikal, for example, the Chinese guides explain them that this is originally Chinese uh, uh, soil and country. And uh, this makes Russians, so, oh, of course, worry a little. So uh, is this question of uh, Russian annexes of uh, China, uh, do they come to table? OK, yes, please. Hi, Randy Schunemann, foreign policy consultant from Washington, D.C. First, just kind of a comment or uh, directed to Yerker on something he said vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Hague decision on the South China Sea. We do not know if this was a result of Chinese pressure. They may have just wanted good relations with China. I think that's the point. If you can get countries to do your bidding without even asking them to do your bidding, um, your, your power, soft, sharp, or otherwise, uh, is enhanced. Um, but my question is on the weak links in Europe, and maybe mostly for Alan 
and Roland, since they're the non-governmental, non-institutional folks here. Um, you have the three that uh, forced an incredibly weak statement on the South China Sea. You have Hungary that uh, um, did not sign on the EU ambassador's letter on uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, saying Europe wouldn't participate under Chinese conditions, which we haven't, uh, which we haven't discussed. Um, who are the weak links? Uh, and you mentioned Greece and uh, the port of Piraeus acquisition. Who are the weak links? Um, why are they the weak links? And what can be done to reinforce those weak links? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the clock, so why don't you answer these questions as you prefer? Mm -hmm. And let's start from this way and also kind of wind okay. it up with closing well, statements. Well, okay, let's, let's take the trapped question first. You know, are they going to get uh, in the middle income trap? Are they, are they going to make it? You know, my own view about all of this is that um, you know, the, the classic argument is to say, well, China will change. They've got the, the original kind of industrial development model uh, with state-owned enterprises, and now they'll move to a stage where they're more focused on consumers and high technology and open. The problem with all of that is that's what they should do. Well, they've been talking about it since at least 2000, and they never really do it. And in fact, since 2008, what you've seen is the Chinese economy has almost shifted back to a more state-owned enterprise model. Now, they talk about it, and there's particular examples of stuff they're doing, and they have various high-techy bits and pieces. But the point is, is that the, the essential model of where it's directly controlled by the CCP is there. And one of the things I said, which didn't go down very well with some senior Chinese officials, I said, if you want China to be the global superpower of the second half of the 21st century, the Communist Party has to die. The only way that China is going to prosper is for the Communist Party to die. And I think, unfortunately, the Chinese Communist Party is not sufficiently patriotic for China's long-term interests <laughs> to actually deliver that. And I think the, the, the consequence of that can already be seen. Uh, in uh, David Shambuk had a book last year out called China's Future. Uh, one of the stats he made, and my, my first bit of my stat is not the killer stat, is that China's, uh, the percentage of debt to GDP is 283%. That's local government, central government, and corporate debt. But that's not the killer stat. The killer stat is two-thirds of that date, debt has been generated since 2008. And the point about that is that the, most of the economic growth since 2008 is simply debt creation. They've been borrowing from the future. And you know, even with the, the enormous financial resources that are available from the Chinese economy, I mean, one of my jokes about it is all about all the capital misallocation, is that what China is currently undergoing is the largest capital misallocation in history since the building of the pyramids. And I think that is, that is, a, that is the order of magnitude of what is going on. So if you answer, is, is, are, they, are they trapped? Yes. Are they going to collapse? Probably no. Uh, what we're looking at is probably stagnancy. Uh, and with, I think, the, and the thing is, is if you've got that, that uh, modus operandi, then what you're going to do is the M&A strategy, where you simply try and buy the Syngentas of the West. And because of CFIUS, it's that's likely going to be Europe. That's going to be the strategy to try and innovate, rather than try and do it at home. Because to do it at home means to, to effectively take out the Communist Party system, which they're not going to do. And so that is where, where, where we end up with that. Um, okay. I, I, know, I think I should probably okay. stop there. Great. Okay, Yerker. Uh, let me just reiterate uh, the fact that, well, Syngenta, a huge investment, 43 billion US dollars. Yeah. But there's a lot that we're not aware of that's happening today. Yeah, it's true, um, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe going slightly off topic, but uh, the issue of Taiwan um, and uh, Russian Far East and, uh, and, and sort of uh, possible um, territorial Concerns in Russia, um, I think uh, it's uh, important to keep in mind that these are two very different issues and I think that Russia increasingly is uh, adapting itself uh, to a situation where it's the little brother that actually doesn't have much say in the relationship, but it's the, the relationship is increase, increasingly steered by China and um, uh, whether there are any concerns in the Russian Far East uh, I don't think, I don't see them playing any kind of uh, role. And, and uh, tourist guides 
would make those jokes. I've heard them before. Um, I, I just uh, comment briefly on, on the Hague decision. I, I, um, I agree totally that the, um, uh, the, the fact whether, whether it's um, an approach by China or not, uh, or if it's pressure, uh, active pressure or not, um, doesn't really matter. Uh, what, what matters is how other states um, act. Um, and uh, I, I think, yeah, that's an important point. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, I'm very glad that the question as to who are the weak links was not addressed to uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> No, sure? I, won't, I will not reply. <laughs> I'll uh, do that. That's all right. Um, in terms of will China change uh, the middle trap, uh, look, I can only speak on the basis of my experience uh, negotiating with China and what I witness when I am in China, which is often, uh, and what we assess in discussion with European companies we shall not count on it happening. And I am not convinced that there is no possibility for China to innovate because you have the China Communist Party in charge. Uh, that's not what we see. I, I, I think there is absolutely no doubt that, that China is becoming increasingly competitive and innovative. And uh, it is serious that they will be leading in technology on a number of fields. They have a competitive advantage, which is enormous. You have 1.4 billion people where, for instance, you're going to be able to use data and mine data in an unrestricted manner uh, without, for instance, the type of privacy rules and concerns we have in Europe, uh, which is like the ideal environment for the development of artificial intelligence, uh, new discoveries in medicines, what have you. Um, so I, I don't think we should count on uh, they are going to collapse. Uh, China is likely to be uh, the first economy of the world in anybody, anybody guess whether it's going to be 15 years more or less. <laughs> we have to learn to deal with China and work with China. Uh, and that is, that, is, that is the issue all governments are having a problem with. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, we're not, we should not be sit and wait until it doesn't work in China. We have to find the way to get a relationship which is an economic relationship which is, is, is very, very important. We may like or not certain aspects of China, but it is of fundamental importance for the economy of Europe and all of our member states. So we have to find a way to have a better level playing field when we deal with them. Excellent. Well, it's correct that we shouldn't wait for China to collapse. That's always a bad strategy. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but neither is a future in which China is the center of the world set in stone. Uh, the way that the Xi Jinping uh, Xi Jinping and his, le his, his, his leadership um, are imagining the future is not necessarily the way it is actually going to be in 50 years from now. Uh, <clears throat> the, West, the West looked finished a couple of times in history, you know, uh, like the 1930s, for example. And the West has always had this amazing and maybe to its detractors annoying uh, ability of bouncing back when you least expect it. Uh, so, you know, I mean, this, uh, this, is all, this all goes to say that, that, you know, there is no automatism to China ruling the world. The fact that, uh, you know, we have made the wrong assumptions in 1989 about not only China, but much of the rest of the world, uh, doesn't mean, doesn't mean that, uh, for example, democracy and, and, and China are incompatible. I mean, the, you know, one of the, to, to, to the, to Beijing annoying facts about Taiwan is precisely that they live, they deliver the daily proof 
that uh, an, an alleged incompatibility between Chinese culture and parliamentary democracy and the rule of law uh, is not true. Uh, that, that's, uh, it, 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 I think these, these are factors that we need to remind ourselves of. Um, and a last word about the, the, what, who are the weakest links in the European Union. Um, it, it's certainly it's three group, or I see three motivations that are not mutually, not mutually exclusive. Um, one is countries that are cash strapped, very simply, that, that, that look for investment because they, they, they think they can't get uh, uh, investment anywhere else. Um, the second one is certainly, uh, a tendency to try to offset Brussels, if you want, you know, to to have an alternative uh, source of income if uh, Brussels gets too pesky. Um, uh, excuse my French. Um, and uh, you know, there there are a couple of countries among the new member states, um, for example, Poland, that have at least dished out this narrative for some time in the last two or three years. The Kaczynski well, peace government in Poland has tried to play these geopolitical games saying we, 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 we should use the Chinese angle to be less dependent on Brussels and of course Berlin. Uh, uh, and it, I don't think it has gotten very far. But, but it's a narrative that still exists. And the third one, the third one is <laughs> true ideological admiration. And I mean, there's only one example that comes to mind here and that is Viktor Orban's Hungary, of course, um, where, where you know, it, it is undeniable that, um, and he said this several times in his, in his whole critique of, of liberal democracy, it is undeniable that there is a degree of attractiveness that he sees in the rule of the Chinese Communist Party and the economic nationalism that he believes to see there. Uh, it, that is an outlier in the European Union. That is, uh, I, I, as I said, you know, Hungary is the only country that comes to mind. And, uh, uh, otherwise, it, it's more the, the two other motivations. Now, how to deal with this? Well, that's the, that's the billion dollar question for the future, of course. And just to follow up, um, I think your example is about the arbitral tribunal is preemptive obedience. And Hungary, um, no one really reported about this, but I wrote an article how they actually issued a statement after the EU made a statement. And that's just not done, because the EU speaks for everyone. And then Hungary, to show how much they supported China's position, they even wrote a stronger statement of support. Yeah, so actually I think it sounded like a direct translation from Chinese. That's what people said, <laughs> that it was translated from Chinese. Um, and uh, since Roland touched on that very uh, difficult topic, I won't follow up anymore, but I think uh, you know, China, as you said, is a game changer, but hegemons want to set the rules. And China is slowly eroding or changing the rules. And we've seen Europe trying to stand up against BRI. They wouldn't sign the uh, MOU uh, because of three things, which we didn't discuss on this panel, but um, standards, environments, and transparency. And kind of Europe is like, no, we're not going to do this. And, and China is hoping that slowly, uh, because we've seen it in many other businesses, or even there's a recent example of Cambridge uh, uh, University Press, one of the most prestigious journals in the entire world, and they said that they would self-censor in order to get into the Chinese market. So there's this idea that, you know, principal pragmatism, people will kind of um, go into, you know, it's a, it's a great market, so maybe they could compromise their values. But to, to follow up with... Um, your president's uh, comment at the dinner, and to tie in Leonard Mary, uh, you know, do not trade on principles. And I think that this is really important for, for Europe to keep in mind. And in a country like Estonia, which understands from their own personal history uh, how important it is to keep up these principles. So I want to thank this amazing panel, and you've been such a great audience and wonderful questions. So thank you very, very much. Thank you.